Dying from diseases on the battlefield during World War II was a grim reality for many thousands of soldiers. The Germans, like the other warring nations, keenly understood the dangers of disease after World War I. So when they had human guinea pigs to test on in the Second War, they did so. And the story is horrifying. It's hard to say just how many soldiers died from various diseases during World War I. The numbers change depending on what resource you're reading. But anywhere you look, you'll see that disease was one of the leading causes of death. It's thought that death from disease combining all nations' military personnel numbered over 2 million. So not surprisingly, this was a major concern of the Nazis during the war that followed. To lessen the number of disease fatalities, they worked on creating vaccines. As you know, in a normal world, vaccines go through rigorous testing before they're given to human populations at large. But the Nazis, believing their prisoners of war were entirely expendable, if not a plague to humanity in their twisted thesis regarding a superior race, they did not worry about their test subjects' well-being. We'll start with the disease malaria, which as you know is carried by that troublesome creature the mosquito. After a person's bitten, they'll start to show symptoms after about 10 to 15 days. This usually means the onset of a terrible fever, headaches, and worse, coma followed by death. Even today, around 400,000 people die each year from malaria. From 1942 to 1945, the Nazis used prisoners at the Dachau concentration camp to try to understand how to treat malaria in their own troops. This involved giving a purposefully infected person drugs after infection and also testing prophylactics, meaning drugs given prior to infection. Prisoners were sometimes infected by the mosquitoes themselves, other times German doctors extracted the disease from the mucous glands of mosquitoes and injected it into the prisoners. One of the main people behind these experiments was a professor of tropical diseases named Klaus Schilling. He was a highly educated man, but not one it seems that had any scruples about infecting unwitting people with a disease. Prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, he'd taken part in a malaria immunization experiment on Italian inmates at a psychiatric hospital. So it's no surprise that during the war he came to the attention of the Nazis. Now let's take a look at testimony from the Nuremberg trials, after which Mr. Schilling experienced a bad end of the noose. During the trials, it was said that most of the malaria victims in the camps were Poles, Russians, and Yugoslavs. Here's a snippet of some of that testimony. Requests for prisoners were made by Schilling. One such request was admitted into evidence, stating that Polish prisoners were requested. A list of inmates were prepared in the camp physician's office, the inmates being of all nationalities which were represented in the camp. 1,200 prisoners were selected in total and none of them had volunteered. In case you're wondering, sometimes inmates would volunteer for experiments because they'd been promised a reward. Unfortunately, they didn't always receive that reward. The testimony says that priests were often the chosen ones for these malaria experiments. The Nazis didn't only persecute Jews, they were also anti-Christian, a religion according to one scholar that Hitler said was only fit for slaves. One of the test subjects was named Father Koch. He explained that in the camp he was told to put his hands inside a box. That box was full of mosquitoes. He had to do that every day for a period of seven days. At the trials, it was explained, Every afternoon, another box of mosquitoes was put between his legs while he was in bed. Each morning, a blood smear was taken from his ear, and his temperature was measured each day and night. He was also given the drug quinine, which today is still used to treat malaria. Father Koch contracted malaria, and after being released from the hospital, he suffered from a high fever and pain in his joints. He was one of the lucky ones that survived his bout with the deadly disease. Others were not so fortunate. Trial testimony stated others were given neosalvarsin, Pirami antipyrin, and a drug numbered 92516, and several combinations of these. Some people died as a result of the experiments. Dr. Schilling was present at the autopsy when there was a death. It was then that he understood the patients had not been able to withstand such large doses of the drugs. According to testimony, death from a neosalvarsin overdose was similar to death from arsenic poisoning. People who had been given high doses of a dangerous drug called pyramidin also died. This drug was used to lower a test subject's temperature. Two young Russian guys were given it after being infected with malaria, and they were dead soon after. The cause of death was the disintegration of blood corpuscles. We won't get into that, but suffice to say, it does not sound very nice. Of course, some people just died from malaria itself. The number was said to be 30, although another 300 or 400 people died from complications due to malaria. We know from the same testimony that there was a typhus outbreak at the camp. The drugs administered to the patients suffering from this were neosalvarsin, atabrine, and quinine. During the trials, Schilling denied that he knew about the beatings of prisoners, stating he thought he was doing work for the good of humanity. In fact, one woman who worked for him for 30 years testified that his intentions at Dachau were good. Other witnesses talked about how professional he was. Still, 
he went to the gallows. Dr. Schilling should have known better was the verdict. Here's how one judge explained it. Being educated and a learned person that he was, Schilling undoubtedly must have realized the manner in which his work suited the needs of the Nazis. Although his personal motives may have stemmed from his desire to aid humanity, he permitted himself to utilize Nazi methods in contrast to other eminent German artists and scientists who either fled or refused to make themselves part of the Nazi system. Ok, now let's move to Typhus. In the book Murderous Medicine, Nazi Doctors, Human Experimentation, and Typhus, it's explained that the Nazis created Jewish ghettos partly under the fabrication that they were trying to contain a typhus epidemic and stop it from reaching the wider public. It was really just an excuse to quarantine a number of people they believed were a threat to their so-called fatherland. Once the Jewish people were removed from the ghettos and sent to the camps, many of them were told they were going to receive a delousing bath, yet the bath was actually the gas chamber. It was also stated in the book that the Nazis kept Jewish people in contained areas because the doctors favored overcrowded and unsanitary conditions to permit the epidemic to flourish, killing as many people as possible. Typhus is a terrible way to die, too, usually starting with a high fever and later bringing on a state of psychosis. Still, not only Jewish people died from typhus, the disease which is spread by lice or fleas terrified the Nazis. Scholars have since pointed out that the Nazis looked at the disease just as they looked at the Jews, whom they saw as a parasite on their country, just as the lice were a parasite on humans. Many Nazi troops were dying in numbers from typhus on the Eastern Front, and so they needed a vaccination. They also needed people to test it on. On top of that, dealing with disease-carrying microscopic creatures is a dangerous job, so the Nazis again needed to enlist expendable volunteers. Some people did actually volunteer for this, but only because the alternative was likely the gas chamber and incinerator. One of the men responsible for making that vaccine was the bacteriologist and head of the SS Hygiene Institute in Berlin, Joachim Murogowski. He already knew that a successful vaccine had been made by the Polish biologist Rudolf Weigel, but that involved using the typhus germ taken from lice intestines. The Nazis didn't want to invite millions of lice into a camp, so a workaround was needed. Weigel, by the way, ended up saving thousands of Jewish lives with his vaccine. Rabbits were a better choice than lice when it came to experimentation, thanks to a French scientist named Paul Giraud. It was discovered that typhus bacteria could be grown in the lungs of rabbits as long as the rabbits had a very weakened immune system. The bacteria that were grown could then be used in the vaccine. Murugowski wrote in a memo, This vaccine has been tested among concentration camp inmates with excellent results. Still, making vaccines is serious business. Even the French experts had a hard time making it. Never mind Nazi scientists who were working with prisoners from all walks of life. According to an article in Politico, some of the prisoners who worked on the bacterium included a baker and a gym coach. Another guy worked in politics, so they were hardly suited to make life-saving vaccines. The typhus bacteria only lived in lice and humans, so getting it into rabbits was a problem. In short, blood from an infected person was injected into guinea pigs, real ones. Their infected brains or testes were mashed up and the infected liquid produced went into mice. Liquid from their mashed up lungs was subsequently injected into those poor bunny rabbits. But remember, the rabbits had to be immunocompromised. That was the only way the bacteria could survive. Making the rabbit's immune systems impaired took a number of steps, but it was basically involving frightening the life out of them. Dunking them in freezing cold water after they'd been shaved seemed to do the trick. In the end, two types of vaccines were made, one that worked and one that didn't work. It seems that one that didn't work ended up being injected into the arms of many German soldiers on the front line. The Nazi scientists nor the soldiers knew it didn't work, of course. It also didn't work for people in the camps, although the good vaccine was used for those forced to work at the camp. During the trial of Murugowski after the war, it was stated that typhus was just one disease of many that the Nazis experimented with. Other diseases included cholera, yellow fever, psittacosis, plague, smallpox, and typhoid. The testimonies that cover these experiments are hundreds of pages long. With the gist of much of what was said is humans were injected with those diseases, they were given drugs to cure them, and if the drugs didn't work the disease often killed the people. The Nazis also conducted experiments involving what was referred to as infectious jaundice, which is the hepatitis virus. These experiments used mainly Polish prisoners at the Sachsenhausen and Natzweiler concentration camps and were conducted between June 1943 and January 1945. Hermann Becker Freising was one of the people involved, although details on what he actually did are scant. Years later, he actually ended up working for the United States on the space medicine program. 
Kurt Blum was another man who went over to the US, even though he was obviously guilty of a number of heinous crimes. He worked on some top secret projects in the US, which is the reason he was spared a lengthy prison sentence or the gallows. More than 300 Nazi scientists were scooped up by the US. The mindset was good minds shouldn't go to waste. In the camps, Blum conducted experiments involving the artificial mass transmission of the malaria parasite to humans. He also infected prisoners with the hepatitis and bubonic plague. At the Nuremberg trials, one witness said he was there when prisoners carrying the hepatitis virus were experimented on. He talked about seeing doctors giving patients liver punctures, although he didn't explain exactly what they were for. He was likely referring to liver biopsies, a procedure that these days people receive local anesthetic for. When asked if he thought the patient suffered, he replied, here we are concerned with an operation which only lasts for a few seconds, but judging from the demeanor of the patient, we could see that we weren't concerned with any trifles. This operation must have been painful. On page 733 of one transcript, it stated experimental subjects were deliberately infected with epidemic jaundice, some of whom have died as a result, and others were caused great pain and suffering. We could go on about epidemic jaundice, but the stories are much the same. As for the plague, Mr. Blom was attempting to weaponize it. Part of his work involved handling the plague, such as you have to do if you're going to turn it into a weapon. As you know, this is called biological warfare. It was Blum's specialty, hence his being hired by the US and evading the noose. Hitler, by the way, was against the use of biological weapons. Blum also worked in developing the plague vaccines, and for that he required test subjects. It said he introduced the plague as well as tuberculosis to thousands of prisoners. One resource states that the US withheld incriminating evidence that demonstrated his role as a supervisor of such horrific experiments, and that's why we can't tell you much about his plague experiments. Now you need to watch The Seawater Torture, Nazi Camp Experiments, or have a look at this.